It's always hard for a parent having to say bye to a kid, isn't it? Yep. Guess what? The father did it to his son when Jesus stepped out of heaven. It is one week till Christmas. One week till Christmas Day. You excited? Yes. Yes. Oh. Look, I know for some of those, some of those that are going, mm, yes. You know, the response is because they're the ones who are usually left to, with the job of having to clean the house, with having to prepare all the meals and get everything organised. They're the ones going, there's still just not enough time. Then there's others you ask, are you ready for Christmas? And they go, oh, yes. Why? What are they looking forward to? Getting presents. <laughs> Bring it on. I want a new dog. Really? Yeah. No. And then there are other people who, they're a bit more reflective when it comes to Christmas. You know, they ponder and they think, well, what's this Christmas really going to look like? And then they go into the deep thought of, well, what was last Christmas like and the one before that? And, and then they start to consider, well, what's next Christmas going to look like? And you go, just stay where you are. But there are some people who do. They, they, Christmas is that reflective time for them. But what are you looking forward to at Christmas time? Anyone? Response? Family time? Thanks, Cole. Anyone else? What are you looking forward to at Christmas? Stopping work? <laughs> time off work? Yeah. Anyone else? What are you looking forward to at Christmas? Food? Yeah. Well, let me give you a list of some of the things that people look forward to at Christmas time. Okay, now this is a bit of bingo, all right? Let's see how many of you get the whole list. Putting up the Christmas tree. Visiting Christmas lights. Wrapping presents. Giving gifts. Getting together with family and friends. Singing Christmas carols. Watching Christmas movies. Die Hard. That's for you, all right? Love Actually, Home Alone, and of course, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Food, holidays. Anyone got all, every single one on the list yet? No? Well, there's one more. The Boxing Day Test Match. <laughs> yes. Goes, what? Hang on. Someone hand some soap to her. She just needs to you know, go South Africa. Really? <sighs> Bob, you're next to her. You can pray for her, okay? You know, no. you know, for, for, look, there's a whole lot of things, but for many people, Christmas, it becomes that time of giving. But you know what? We can give right throughout the year. We can give presents. We, we can actually give flowers. We give affirmation. We give encouragement. But at Christmas time, there seems to be this over-importance upon, oh, no, the act of giving. In fact, back in 1984 there was this group of musicians that formed together at, to come under the name Band Aid. Yep, they sing a song. Do they know it's Christmas time at all? They were singing because there were thousands of people in Africa, children, who were starving because they had nothing and yet the rest of the world was living in their affluence. And so they were going, do you know what? Do they know it's Christmas time at all because they've got nothing and we want them to know that it is Christmas. And so here it was, this one time of the year, they raised all this money, inundated them with food, and then it got forgotten. Yet for those children who did receive a meal, suddenly they were just overwhelmed and they were grateful for what they'd received. But have you ever seen the facial reaction of a person who receives a present and it's one that they just don't want? Hmm. Oh, sorry, Dan. <laughs> you know, it's that face of disappointment. In fact, last year alone in Australia, 53% of people living in Australia received an unwanted Christmas gift. That's a lot of people. And you know when it's unwanted because the person opens it, smiles, stares at you wide-eyed and gleefully says, you shouldn't have. <laughs> and really what they're thinking is, and I wish you didn't. <laughs> but let me say, with one week to Christmas, this is the list of the, some of the most unwanted gifts. Clothing and accessories, household items, cosmetics and fragrances, 
literature, food and drink, technology, music. Really? What then are we left to buy for people? <laughs> now, whilst there may be gifts that, you know, uh, yeah, chocolate, that is part of food, all right? Sorry, but, you know, whilst there is, uh, some of these, these gifts, they might not be high on the priority list. The problem is that where's the emphasis we're looking? We're looking at, well, what am I getting rather than what am I giving? I want to look this morning at the heart of people and how there were a number of people who gave and it flowed out of their hearts in what they gave. And this is all just in terms of looking at, firstly, the people around Jesus' birth, people who gave with all their heart. First one we'll look at is Mary. Here's this teenager with her whole life ahead of her and yet any plans that she did have were suddenly drastically changed because Gabriel, an angel, turned up and said, Hey, Mary, greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. For Mary, she was engaged to a guy by the name of Joseph. And according to Jewish custom, marriage would have been negotiated by their fathers. So they're not the ones who had a say in it. As well as that, a dowry would have been paid in compensation for the loss of a working family member. And the reason, and she would also have then been, become the legal wife of Joseph, even though they were not at that stage living together. Reason for this, Mary had to live with her family during this time of betrothal, a one-year period where she was considered married in every way, except for the fact that they were not cohabitating and there was no consummation of their marriage. But yet during that time, Joseph would have been off preparing his place for his new bride. And so when Gabriel spoke to Mary, here it was that she was engaged to Joseph. What does that tell us? That the plans of God did not only include Mary, but also Joseph was part of it. Why? Because it didn't happen before they were engaged, it happened when they were engaged. And Gabriel continued and said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. Mary was going to be a pregnant teenager. Now, back then, that wouldn't have been unusual. But it was what was unusual is it wasn't through some bloke doing it. It was through the Holy Spirit. But who was going to believe her? It was also possible that proof of her virginity was required before betrothal. So her pregnancy suddenly would have aroused suspicions and maybe even accusations. And pregnancy during betrothal was considered a breach of the marriage vows and punishable by execution. And if it was Joseph who actually accused her of adultery, then he would have had her stoned at her father's doorstep. Why at her father's doorstep? Because her father was the one who was responsible for her and he should have made sure that she had kept herself pure. But yet despite these risks, Mary willingly gave herself to God. She said, I am the Lord's servant. She didn't kick up a fast. She didn't go, oh, hang on, what's Joseph going to say? There's none of that ever recorded. Instead, she willingly gave herself to God. Another person who willingly gave just from their heart was Joseph. Here's this bloke who found out that Mary was pregnant. And Matthew says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. In other words, he wasn't going to go and stone her at her dad's doorstep. But also, what we read in that verse is that Joseph was an honourable bloke. He was faithful. That word faithful, it means he was known for his uncompromising obedience to the law of Moses. And the law of Moses dictated that a person who was unfaithful, that a person who had compromised their, their marriage vows, was punishable by death. And so for Joseph, he had this decision of, was he going to be obedient to the law or was he going to compromise? And so we read that after, this, he, had, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. That word considered means reflected and ached. He just didn't go, oh, should I or shouldn't I? He actually, it ached him, it hurt him trying to discern what should he do. 
And we realise that he had this great love for Mary because he didn't want to expose her to a public disgrace. But it, what it does also reveal is that he, actually, he must have decided that he was going to divorce her. But before he got a chance to do that, the angel visited him in a dream and helped him to be able to change his mind. What the angel pointed out was what was going to become of this child. The angel also pointed out, you know what, Mary, your wife, she hasn't been unfaithful. In fact, she has been the opposite. She has been faithful. She has willingly given herself to God for God to fulfill his plans. And so for Joseph, he chose mercy over justice. He obeyed God by taking Mary as his wife and he gave up his right as a husband and he gave himself willingly to God and surrendered to God. Third part of it is I want to look at is Mary and Joseph. Together, they gave up their comforts to, in order to obey God and God's plans in their lives. Where was Jesus born? In a stable. Mm -hmm. See, growing up, I was always told that there was no room for them in the inn. So therefore, the assumption is that Jesus was then therefore born in a stable. Okay? In the NIV translation. We read Luke chapter 2, verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, that's today's NIV. If we go back to 1984, the NIV version as it was written then, okay, it's had a number of improves along the way, I have to say. But in the 1984 version, we read, there was no room for them in the inn. Now, there's a number of other translations today that use that same word, in. If we look at our Greek, we realise that Luke, when he wrote his book, his book, he uses two different words, two different Greek words for the word in, I double N. One of them is used in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the, good, you know, the, the person who you know, goes to the inn and they actually care for them and he pays for them to be cared for. Right? That's one. The other one is used here. In Luke chapter 2, verse 7, but also in Luke chapter 22, verse 11, where Jesus encourages a couple of his disciples to go off and make preparations for them that they would be able to celebrate the Passover meal. And where were they to do it? In the guest room. So what do we conclude from that? It's probable that they actually, for Mary and Joseph, what they stayed in was actually the guest room, also known as where some of the animals would also be kept. Why? Because they were some of the prize animals the ones that they really loved and cared for. But as well as that, what do we realise from it is that, and this was, I have to say, the picture I was always given of Mary and Joseph when I was growing up is that Mary and Joseph went from house to house or in, you know, knock, you know, knocking on doors saying, hey, you know, is there a place, is there a place, is there a place? And in actual fact, it wasn't that way at all. Because there's a ver verse in Luke that says, while they were there. It implies that they had actually been there a little while. And while they were there, the it was time for the baby to be born. It wasn't something that just suddenly happened. As well as that, we need to look at the fact that they weren't just among strangers. Why? Because all the relatives had also gone to that place in order to register. So they would have had some family members around them. The other part of recognising that word in in terms of a place to stay. When I mentioned about the Good Samaritan, you know, in our Western mindset, when we hear the word in, we often think of a hotel. That's what that description is of the Good Samaritan. But back then, a lot of those places were undesirable places, ones that were not safe. And that's not where Jesus was born. But what we do get out of this is that both for Mary and Joseph, they gave up their comfort. They were away from where they, from their own home, where they would have had all that they needed. They were there in a room where there would have been smelly and there would have been animals. But as well as that, they gave up their comfort of, and also their plans of what is it that they had in mind that they may have wanted to do in life. To instead go, God, you've entrusted us with your son and what are we going to now do to honour that? They willingly gave. Let me just share briefly a couple of others who gave. The shepherds. After learning of the birth of Jesus, they hurried off to find the baby. And what did they do afterwards? They went off spreading the word concerning what had been told about this child. What flowed out of their hearts was the testimony of what they'd been told. 
What did they give? They gave testimony. 40 days after Jesus' birth, he's presented at the temple. At the temple, here's one of the people, key people there, Simeon, God-fearing man. In fact, the scripture says that he was righteous and devout and the Holy Spirit was on him. And the Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. For Simeon, he had given himself fully to the Lord and to the Lord's work. And God fulfilled his promise to him. For Simeon, he took Jesus in his arms. And his immediate reaction was he gave praise to God. The person who's there standing alongside was Anna, the prophetess. She too saw the baby Jesus. And what did she do? She immediately gave praise to God. So we've got people who gave testimony, people gave testimony. Praise, Kabul gave thanks all to God. And then we have the wise men who presented these gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Gold, symbolic of kingship on earth. Frankincense, symbolic of deity. And myrrh, symbol of death. These wise men, they gave these gifts. But you know what? They also, scripture says, they also gave worship to Jesus. For all of these people, what it flowed, their giving, it flowed out of their hearts. And in giving, they declared the Messiah had come. Most of us are familiar with John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. God gave us his one and only Son. And Jesus, he gave with all his heart. Let me share with you briefly how Jesus giving with all his heart, how that was reflected. One, stepping out of heaven to earth. He came down from heaven to earth. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Jesus stepped from heaven to earth for us, that he would become fully human. He gave himself to be fully human that he was fully human, but also fully divine. How do we know this? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 8. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus gave himself that he would be fully human. But in doing so, he surrendered himself and surrendered his sinlessness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But for Jesus, taking on that sin meant that it sacrificed his relationship to his father. Read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Why was there darkness over the land when Jesus was there dying on the cross? Was it for a dramatic effect? Why? Because the Father could not look on his Son and the sin, our sin, that he bore. It's the first time Jesus was ever separated from the Father's presence because of our sin. But Jesus not only gave in terms of sacrificing himself for us but he gave up his right to even use the authority that was his you know an example of this his right to call 12 legion of angels matthew 26 verse 53 and 4 do you think i cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels but how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way Jesus gave himself in obedience to the Father, even though he knew he had this authority at his disposal, but he was looking more at the scriptures and their fulfillment and obedience before his Father. And because of that, he allowed his body to be flogged and skin ripped from his body. He gave himself willingly for us. I have to say, flogging back then is not a nice thing. It's not a nice thing at all anyway, anytime. But for the Romans... They used to make a whip out of several strips of leather and into which that leather, right near the ends, they would embed pieces of bone and lead so that when they did this whip, it would actually rip flesh of a person. 
Now, the Jews, I have to say, they were really nice because they limited the number of stripes, that is, the number of whips, uh, times they whipped a person, they limited it to 40. But in actual practice, they did 39 in case they miscounted. But for the Romans, they didn't limit it. No limitation was recognised by them and the victims of Roman floggings often did not survive. Yet Jesus gave himself willingly for that. And he gave himself willingly by shedding his blood for our forgiveness of sin. Matthew 26, 28, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. See, Jesus, he gave his life for each one of us. And there are seven, seven places in the New Testament where the words God gave himself for are directly associated with Jesus' substitutionary work. In each case, the Greek word hupa, is translate, which is translated for, is used. And it means to act on behalf of another. Jesus acted on behalf of us. Let me give you the seven. Firstly, he ransomed, he gave himself, and he, he gave himself as a ransom for all. He gave himself for our sins. Number three, he gave himself to stand in our place. He gave himself up for us. He gave himself to make us acceptable to God. I love this, as a fragrant offering, sacrifice to God. Guess what? We smell nice before God because of Jesus. He gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness. And he gave to remind us of our obligation to him. This is my body which is given for you. But Jesus, he gave with all his heart and in him giving, he was declaring the Messiah not only has come, but he was declaring the Messiah is here. So we're focused on those who gave around Jesus' birth and how they gave from their heart and how Jesus, he gave with all his heart. But what about us? How do we give? We can give cheek at another person's expense. We can give grief to our parents as we grow up. We can give to the poor. We might even give our best to our workplace. We can give our attention to what we think is important. But how do we express giving that reflects who Jesus is in our life? Giving that's taking up our cross and following Jesus daily. Giving that's evidence of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. Giving that has this impact on others. As we mentioned earlier, Viv was taken to hospital this last week. Now, one of the things that some people might not realise is that for Viv and Candice, they've sold their house at Mount Gravatt and settlements on the 22nd. Now, most of their stuff had already been moved, but there were still a few items there. And they were facing a dilemma going, what do we do? How do we move our things? On Tuesday, we put out a mess text message asking if people were able to help. And by Wednesday, I'd received a notification from 10 people saying, I'll be there, I can help. And I was texting Candace's dad, his name's Paul. And I said to him, I've hired a truck and at this stage I've got 10 people who are able to come and help and we'll be there tomorrow morning. And Paul responded in the text and he said, Brad, that's awesome. You have brought tears to my eyes. That's the church at work. I have to tell you, that's the church. Here's the, you know, the crowd of people that came and helped. You know, it was such an incredible blessing. And for Paul, he had those tears in his eyes because he said, and he said to me on the day, I could never have done this. I could never get a group like this. This is the church. Giving. Giving that has an impact on others. We read in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, Jesus said, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. But five verses later, then Jesus then says, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Guess what? It's not about the person, it's Jesus. That's who we're doing it for. 
At times we look at you know, some of the faces of people and go, I don't want to catch that. No. Guess what? Jesus is saying, if you didn't do it for them, you didn't do it for me. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. It's not enough to just receive what Jesus has done for us. It's giving praise to him, giving testimony, giving, giving thanks to him. It's giving that others would know Jesus. Giving to reflect Jesus' heart. The giving that declares not only has the Messiah been born, not only has the Messiah come, but guess what? Jesus is coming again. It's a declaration that, guess what? Jesus is coming soon. But in giving with our heart, it actually comes at a cost. It's not something we go, oh, I can spare this much, or, you know, I can do this, or I've got that much time. No, no, it comes at a cost. It's a bit like the widow with her little two mites. Even my term then, little two mites. We minimise it, but yet Jesus didn't. He said what she gave was far more than all the others because the others only gave out of their abundance. This last year, the Queen, Queen of England, she passed away. But one of the things that uh, the story is being told of the Queen that she used to regularly visit Bob Morrow Castle. And on one occasion, she was there walking by herself and it started to rain. She rushed to the shelter of the nearest cottage and a lady came to the door who was really ticked off that someone would bother her at that time of the morning. And she opened the door just a few inches and barked, What do you want? The queen didn't introduce herself. She merely asked, May I borrow an umbrella? Just a minute, grumbled the woman. She slammed the door and was gone for a moment and returned to bring the rattiest umbrella she could find, one with broken ribs and small holes she pushed it through the door and said, here. The Queen of England thanked her and went on her way with the ragged umbrella. Next morning, the Queen's full escort, dressed in full uniform, pulled up in front of the cottage. One of the escorts knocked on the door and returned the umbrella to the woman, saying, Madame, the Queen of England thanks you. As he walked away, he heard the woman mutter, if I'd only known... I would have given her my best. Sometimes we only have one opportunity to be able to give our best. The giving of those at Jesus' birth, they declared the Messiah had come. Jesus gave, declaring the Messiah is here. For us, we give, declaring the Messiah is coming again soon. Throughout history, people who, who have wanted to make a difference beyond themselves, they all have, each one of them have actually looked at what they can give rather than what it is that they would receive. But Jesus, he gave fully for each one of us. And he invites us to give ourselves fully to him. As we approach Christmas, my question for each one of us is, what does giving look like for you? The Bible says, freely you have received, freely give. 